Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today I'm talking about the elementary education math exam for all the different states, but specifically I'm going to be talking about the Texas EC6 391 math exam, but this particular video will help you with any elementary education math test that you might be taking for your teacher certification. Let's get started. All right, so today I'm talking specifically about the EC6391 math exam. However, you can use this video for many teacher certifications in math, and you are going to be asked these type of teaching math questions on many exams. So for example, the Praxis 7813 math exam is an elementary ed exam where you are not just asked math questions like how to work through math problems, but you're also going to be asked about the teaching part of math, which can be difficult for those of you who have never taught before. So I'm going to go through the EC6391 math examples because that is the latest program I am working on, should be done in January 2022. But I am immersed in this math um, right now, so I want to make sure that you understand kind of my thinking around this, and I want to help you guys navigate some of these math test questions. So let's hop over here to our um, sample questions that are on the actual test makers website. Now remember, you're always going to want to look at the test blueprint specifications and sample questions for the exam in which you're taking. And we are going to be looking at sample questions today. But remember, it's not just about sample questions over and over again. We want to have a deeper understanding of these concepts. So if you're just memorizing math questions or you're just memorizing practice tests and doing that over and over and over again, you probably aren't studying properly for the exam. Remember, you're going to be asked these questions in a multitude of ways. So if you're trying to memorize test questions in your practice tests, it's not going to work for you. So I'm going to go over these test questions, but I'm going to dig a little deeper in the concept so you understand why these are the correct answers and why the bad answers are incorrect answers. All right, so let's take a look. This is for competency one, and this is all under math instruction here for the EC6391. But remember, this can help you with any elementary education math teacher certification exam, all right? So let me zoom out here just for a second. Okay, so you know that I always want to work backwards. I don't start here. No, no, no. I do not start up at the top. I'm looking at this item here and I'm kind of navigating it in different ways. I go straight to the answer choices first. So on test day, I'm going to the answer choices first. I can see that I can't really eliminate any answer choices in the moment because they're just one word answers. Okay. So now I continue to work backwards and I'm going to start here. Now, let me show you what happens when I do that. And this is, can be done on many teacher certification exams. So it says, after speaking with several students, the teacher finds that some of them are still having trouble with the concept of negative numbers. As a result, the teacher then, here's very important, reteaches the concept using a number line. Which of the following assessments has the teacher used? Now, the concept of reteaching is going to help me figure this out. Right away, I know that B, C, and D are out. It's not a summative. Summative assessments come at the end of learning and measure outcomes. It is not formal because if you're reteaching a concept and then reassessing, that's not a formal assessment. A formal assessment is like a state standardized test or a midterm or a final. And formal kind of goes with summative. Remember, when we're looking at answer choices, we want to eliminate answer choices that are similar to one another because we're looking for one correct answer in this particular item. And then criterion. Well, criterion is a summative. Criterion is also formal. So we can kind of cross out B, C, and D. This is actually a formative assessment. Now, let's talk about a formative assessment really quickly. A formative assessment is used to inform instruction. That means that you are using this assessment to kind of figure out what your students know and what they don't know. And then you have the opportunity to reteach or target or zero in on the skills the students need and then possibly reassess, recalibrate the class, figure out what's going on, maybe even reteach a little bit more. It's an ongoing 
informal assessment to drive instructional decisions. It is the best type of assessment, in my opinion, to use. Summatives, formal, and criterion, they're good. You know, that we have to use them. We have to use the state standardized assessments. We have to use summatives to put in the grade book. But I feel if you are looking for standards ma mastery and standards acquisition, formative assessment is the best kind of assessment. Now, in this particular example, it is the correct answer. Now, I have a whole video on the different types of assessments you will see on your teacher certification exams, and I will link that up here. So be sure you have a look at that. But for this particular example, notice that I didn't even have to read all of this. When you get into that, you start to fill your brain up with information and you're missing the point. Work backwards to find those correct answers. Now, you might not have been able to figure that out just by reading this. And then what you would do is go up to the top of the question. But I always recommend starting with the answer choices first and then the question stem, which this is basically the question stem. Usually that's at the end of a long scenario question. And then if you still need to take a look at it, you can then go up here into this, you know, scenario and possibly a graph or whatever. But especially on Pearson exams, I will tell you that typically you can work backwards and just read the question stem and get the correct answer. All right, let's take a look at number two. Another giant question here with very long answer choices, very long scenario, and a lot of you get you know freaked out when you see these types of questions. But remember, this strategy today is going to help you with this. These questions are gonna become so easy to you, you're, you're just gonna blow through them, okay? So let's start with the answer choices first. A, allowing students to write their answers on paper, then collecting the papers at the end of the lesson. Okay. B, asking multiple students to share and defend their solutions. Like it. Before acknowledging the correct answer. Defending their solutions is that critical thinking. Remember, we always want to be thinking about higher order questioning, making students defend their solutions, uh, maybe even requiring, requiring students to use evidence, you know, in the text or somewhere to defend their claims. So this is, looks to me like a really good answer choice there. C, asking students who did not hold up their thumbs to share their answer and explain, okay? Having Billy work the problem out on the board in front of the class. This is kind of like, mm, I don't know, because Billy might be kind of freaked out. I don't like singling out one particular student. Right now, I'm going with answer B as my best answer here, but I wanna make sure. So next, let's go with the question stem here. Which of the following instructional adjustments can the teacher make to best assess if all students' understanding of multiplying two-digit numbers? Okay, all students. Now, this is an instructional adjustment. Collecting papers, that is not in the moment adjusting. Also, asking students who did not hold their thumbs up, that's kind of weird, and D is out. I'm definitely crossing out A and definitely crossing out D. I guess C is still in the running, but I still love B the most. Okay, so let's just um, take a look at this right here. Almost every student in the class raised a hand. The teacher writes the next problem on the board. Okay, I need to keep going up here. I don't know what's going on. So let's start here. A fifth grade teacher writes the problem 56 times 12 on the board. Students begin to solve the problem mentally. And as each student finds a solution here, she signals the teacher with a thumbs up. When almost every student has given a thumbs up signal, the teacher has the following dialogue with a student. Here's the teacher. Billy, what answer did you come up with? Billy says, 672. The teacher says, great job, Billy. That is the correct answer. Raise your hand if you found 672 to be the product, like Billy. Okay, so what is going on here? What's wrong with this situation? Well, we can see that Billy answered the question, and then all I did was say, how many of you got the right answer also? Well, what are our kids gonna do? They're gonna go, I did, even if they don't, right? And then the teacher moves on to the next problem. What the teacher is not doing here is really assessing whether or not the students got that answer and if they got it by using the proper math or the mental math that she's been teaching. So the proper adjustments would be, okay, Billy, good job. Um, let's see, did anybody else get 672 without even explaining that it's the correct answer yet? Maybe you have a couple kids raise his or her hand and then you say, okay, Jose, tell me why you got 672. How did you do it? Okay, 
Good. Sally, how did you get your answer? What answer did you get? I got 672 also. Okay. How did you do it? And then asking that, now we know that the students actually got it before moving on. Collecting the papers, I mean, in the middle of, of a lesson is not good. I mean, if it, it meant walking around the room and looking to see how they're doing their math, that's different. But collecting the papers, too much work for one particular problem. Asking students who did not hold their thumbs up to share their answer and explain. Well, why would you have the kids who don't understand share their answer and explain? That just puts them on the spot. Cross it off. And having Billy work the problem out on the board in front of the class, that could work. But the best here is to defend their solutions before acknowledging the correct answer. Don't give it up so easily. Make sure they understand it. Let's take a look and see if we are correct. And we are correct. B is the correct answer there. And I got it before I even read the question. All right, so remember, work backwards for the correct answers on these tests. All right, let's take a look at number three. This is actually a developmentally appropriate problem that you're going to probably encounter on your elementary ed math exam. So I'm gonna look at the answer choices first. A, students will be able to determine the value of a collection of coins and bills. All right, determine the value of collections of coins and bills, all right. Students will be able to represent the value of a collection of coins as a fraction of a dollar, okay. Students will be able to differentiate between money received as income and money received as gifts, all right. Students will be able to solve problems involving money by performing operations on decimals to the hundredths place. Okay, can't really do much there with the answer choices, but I do have an idea that we're looking at student skills here. Let's take a look at the question. Which of the following learning goals is, and here we go, we're always going to see this, most appropriate for a third grade unit on money, okay? So most appropriate for a third grade unit on money. Now, one of the things you want to be on the lookout for in answer choices are those that have to do with the real world, especially with math. We always want to bring the abstract into the concrete so students can, one, see the value of learning it, right? Like we get all the time in math, when am I ever going to use this? When am I ever going to use this crazy algebra, right? So we want to show students how this applies in the real world. And we also want to make sure it's developmentally appropriate for third graders in this situation. So when we keep that in mind, that real world application, which one stands out the most? Well, A does because we're determining a value of a collection of coins and bills. How do we use money? We use money by, you know, separating it out, organizing it in a wallet, understanding that if something is $5.36, how to, you know, distribute that to the cashier, maybe even how to, you know, get our change back, those types of things. So A looks more like it's a real world problem. Let's discredit B, C, and D really quickly. Students will be able to represent the value of a collection of coins as a fraction of a dollar. That seems kind of number one advanced and also um, kind of pointless when we're talking about unit on money. We're talking about how to use money. That's gonna be the most important thing, especially for third grade. You know, if we are talking about fractions, that's different, but we're talking about money and we need to teach them how to use the money. So B is out. C, students will be able to differentiate between money received as income and money received as gifts. That has nothing to do with this. That's just a nonsense answer. And D, students will be able to solve problems involving money by performing operations on decimals to the hundredths place. Okay, if we're talking about developmentally appropriate for third grade, a is best here. Do we use hundredths place when using money? Yeah. So like, for example, $5.36, the 36 at the end of the decimal, the six is in the hundredths place. But like, that's really not how we use money, really. Um, so I'm going to cross out D. A is the best answer. And let's see if it is correct. A is the correct answer. Here it's saying because it describes a Texas essential skill. Remember, the standards for your state are always going to contain good words and operations that you're going to want to look at for your elementary ed exam. But a learning goal identifies that students will learn to be able to do as a result of instruction, not what they will be asked to demonstrate in learning. So here it is to be able to do. And remember, we want students to understand money so they can use money. And A is actually using money. So that's the best answer. 
And finally, let's look at the last question in this competency one that has to do with teaching math. So I am going to look at the answer choices first. A, placing interlocking cubes next to the objects and counting the cubes, all right? B, cutting sheets of construction paper so that they are the same dimensions as the objects. Right away, I can see B is gonna be problematic for elementary students or any students for that matter. I can't even cut construction paper so that it's the right size. I'm gonna eliminate B right away because it just doesn't make sense. C, listening to the teacher explain how to line up a ruler to the objects and mark their lengths. Okay, but listening to the teacher explain, usually not the best answer choice, even though that's what students do. Probably not the best practice for this question, just from my experience. D, watching the teacher demonstrate how to estimate the lengths of objects using a child's hand or shoe. Okay, so in elementary math, oftentimes we'll use objects um, that are not rulers to do things like we'll use paper clips or we'll use pencils to kind of see the length it's like introductory to measurement so right now i'm liking a and d let's go to the question here which of the following activities is and here we go again most effective in helping kindergarten students understand measurement of lengths of small objects such as pencils or cups well i'm not going to use lengths of the child's hand or shoe for pencils or cups, right? Because a shoe is already bigger than the cup. Like that's not going to work there. So D is out. Cutting sheets of construction paper, kindergarten students. So it's the exact length. Absolutely not. Listening to the teacher explain. Well, I guess, but really what students need to do is hands on concrete activities, especially in kindergarten, because those students are still in the concrete stages of learning. So A looks good to me, placing interlocking cubes, you know, those snap cubes you, you have in those elementary grades, placing interlocking cubes to the objects and counting the cubes. So let's say I have, um, let's say this water bottle here, right? It's on the table. And I say, okay, guys, let's figure out how big this water bottle is based on, you know, its cubes. So this would be set on the table. And then the kids would maybe interlock two cubes, then three cubes, probably be one, two, three, four, five, maybe 10 cubes. This is probably 10 cubes long. And just have them start to understand measuring objects. We could also use paper clips. You could use um, sometimes teachers will use like a string of paper clips and students will count how many paper clips there is the length of the object. And all that is doing, while it's not exact inches or exact centimeters or things like that, it's an introduction to measurement, which is really important before we move on to inches and centimeters and millimeters and all of those things, all right? So that's how I would answer number four. All right, so I hope that helps you today with your elementary math teaching questions on your teaching certification exams. These are tough, but remember, always work backwards. Take a look at you know what's going on in the answer choices first. Eliminate bad words. Zero in on those good words and practices, and then read the question stem, and then read the actual question. Now remember, I have lots of videos on test strategy, um, how to work backwards, how to identify good words, bad words. I'll link them all up in the description below and up here where the information is. And remember, we're always here for you. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the comments below and I will answer them the best I can. If you're looking for more resources for your teacher certification exams, you can always go to KathleenJasper.com. We have free webinars here where you can see we have tons of uh, different options here for you. And I'm constantly adding to these free webinars. They come with study guides and PowerPoints, lots of great resources there. We also have study guides on our website that you can check out here. We sell our digital study guides on our website. On our Amazon Prime account, we have our physical study guides. So make sure you check that out. And we also have lots of online courses for you to choose from to help you with your teacher certification exams. Thank you so much for watching today. Please give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and letting your colleagues know we are here. We're trying to help as many teachers as possible. So thanks again and have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. We have a ton of videos on my YouTube channel. Please consider subscribing and following me on my social media networks at Kathleen Jasper. Have a great day. Thank you.